Testing, testing. We are back with uh, Vox podcast uh, and uh, after 17 episodes during uh, the lockdown, uh, lockdown in many countries is over or at least uh, reduced and we are getting uh, started with another episode, the number 18 and we are having today a startup from Tunisia. Uh, Diane, welcome back to join uh, the podcast. I hand it over to you. Thanks, Stefano. All uh, right, so today we are going to uh, talk to, well, Faris, Faris Belgith, which I think I am not pronouncing correctly, um, but you can correct me in a bit. So he's the CEO of a startup called uh, Commune, um, and you can check them out at K I M I, uh, sorry, K A M I O U N dot com. Um, and the quick way of describing what they do, and, and again, Fires can correct me or elaborate more in a bit, is uh, basically, in my opinion, solving the supply chain issues between uh, FMCG, fast-moving uh, consumer goods uh, manufacturers, um, and the informal small grocery shops. Um, and then just, just before I start with the questions, um, I wanted to give a little bit of color on how uh, we met, uh, me and Fires. Uh, we actually have a common friend um, from a friend that I had, uh, we, uh, I had back in London right before I moved to Kenya. So Faris is actually one of the first uh, friends I had moving to Kenya. Um, he was uh, working at Bridge International at that time, uh, which is a social enterprise in the education space. Um, he's also an ex Jumia um, ops person, uh, which is Jumia is the, the Amazon equivalent for Africa. Um, and he's been in a bunch of ops operations, sort of roles, director and whatnot, manager. Um, and he's very well suited, I think, for this um, ops heavy problem that um, he's solving right now. So um, let's get into the questions and let's start with um, uh, Fars. Who, who, so there's you and one other founder. Can you talk about, you know, who's the other founder? What are your roles? Uh, sure. Well, uh, hi everyone, and uh, uh, thanks again. I'm very happy to uh, to be here. Um, so essentially, yes, it's uh, me and another founder. We're um, his name is Abdu, and uh, essentially we're high school friends. Yeah, we go back around uh, 20 years. He had uh, more. He's like a sales and marketing person who moved gradually into product uh, and UI UX design and uh, as uh, you know, initially we, as oftentimes for Tunisians, we started off uh, with France in the uh, uh, in the beginning of our uh, of our careers, and then as I drifted back into Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, um, uh, Abdu was having more of an Asian adventure in actually Malaysia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. So um that's essentially uh, 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 how we know each other and we connected back because we went back we came back to tunisia around the same time so we just kept uh, kept talking about how uh, 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 how we wanted to start something here uh, we both had landed uh, jobs which essentially we took you know to come back uh, and settle down understand the market but we both had this urge to start uh, a business uh, and so, yeah, one thing led to another, and uh, gradually we we uh, we launched Commune, which was initially a, a different a different idea. Uh, and yeah. That's, so, that's so it. far as before we get into the story of that, or further into the story of that, can you tell us uh, the what's the background behind the name Commune, and you know what language? What does it mean? Yeah. So commune is uh, just a Tunisian dialect for truck. Okay, probably co I mean it comes from either Italian or French, uh, and this is how we say it. Like we don't use the classical Arabic word. We say commune, uh, and uh, so the idea because of the the name has not changed throughout the ideas, and it's still relevant, and it just means truck. Uh, so whether a big truck or a a, a small pickup truck, it's it's the same uh, it's the same word. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Okay, so now let's get into the story of the evol uh, evolution of your startup ideas. Um, yeah, go ahead. So 
initially when we were talking, uh, we, 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 we wanted to solve like big problems. We wanted to solve like sort of infrastructural problems. We had uh, uh, different uh, areas we were looking at and um, obviously logistics was one of them, but we didn't want to close doors. So we looked, we thought that uh, there were three key things we were sort of qualified to do. Either try and fix how people move, how people move things, or how people transact. And um, we thought, okay, you know what, actually the backbone of the economy is how things move, okay? 20% uh, of the GDP uh, uh, of uh, Tunisia is a cost of, is a logistics cost, okay? In mature economies, that's like six, 7%, something like that in the US. Even in some less mature economies with uh, more optimized logistics, think of India is like 11 or 12%, okay? <clears throat> so we're like, okay, this is the biggest problem to solve. Uh, and initially we're tackling the uh, line haul uh, sort of problem. So freight or city to city uh, movements in large semi-trailers uh, uh, sort of problem. So this is something that perhaps elsewhere in the continent, you have Trela in Egypt, Kobo 360 in a couple of countries started with Nigeria and Lori maybe in Kenya. So this is the sort of problem they're trying to tackle. How to uh, make the, of the, the supply and demand of transport more liquid reduce the, uh, uh, how do you call that? I uh, um, forgot how it is in English, but uh, the direct translation would be empty kilometers, right? So coming back empty with a truck empty as you do one city to another city and reduce the friction and the time needed to, uh, to actually order for, for, uh, for transport when you're a, a, a manufacturer or, or any sort, or if you have import or export operations. So we were ready with that. We had a different angle. We even went and visited the Trella in Egypt. And you know, we, we, we had an angle where we were like, okay, we're gonna focus with, um, with the driver. We started experimenting and then we're like, okay, we have our angle, let's go see the manufacturers. Bad luck, uh, that was around March, April. Uh, and the, uh, Europe was in lockdown. So the imports reduced drastically in the whole of North Africa. Exports reduced a bit because we were also having our first wave and essentially suddenly it was an oversupplied market. Uh, in an oversupplied market it's a lot more difficult to go and try and like sell this ID. So we had a lot of trouble trying to do that. So we decided let's go to the FMCG manufacturers. They have essential products, you know, food, etc. Like less reliant maybe on, on uh, export and if even so they, it would still happen. So we went to see them. There was some weird uh, uh, tax uh, uh, incentive that they had to acquire second-hand vehicles. So most of them had second-hand vehicles. They were doing their own logistics for like intercity and freight. Um, and uh, they could not even take uh, transport, like they couldn't transport goods for other manufacturers because of the sort of license they have. So we're talking to them, we're like, okay, so okay, what are the, your problems in the logistics space? And that's when they mentioned distribution. So their problem was more on the last mile and it was specifically on this, um, on the distribution to get to these small shops, okay? They didn't have a problem with an organized distribution with Carrefour, Monoprix, and you know, these sort of big organized retailers. They had a problem in that space. Uh, you know, one thing led to another, we're talking and we're not even in the same city with uh, my partner. We couldn't even like, you couldn't even travel from city to city then. And we were closing that fam friend, friends and family around then for the previous idea. And we decided to jump and we're like, you know what, let's, let's just build this. Um, I have experience in e-commerce. It's also a marketplace. So let's build this distribution marketplace with a layer of data where we're gonna allow these uh, FMCG manufacturers to reach more efficiently those retailers and to build sort of a relationship with them where they can, uh, well, they'll know transparently what prices are applied. Uh, they'll know um, what happens with their goods, how their products are performing, okay? Because one thing you need to know is that the way it works right now is if you wanna distribute to these guys, you're gonna go through a scattered network of wholesalers. There may be a, another layer below them and even another one, okay? And the last layer is made of these guys we call Dawarji, who are traveling salesmen. They fill the truck, they buy the goods, and they go door to door and distribute uh, the goods to the, to the small shops, okay? 
So they go, they come and they're like, they have, okay, you know what? I have a tuna for a, a tuna, 160 grams uh, olive oil, this price. You take or you don't take. And the small retailer who may be busy with the customer has to make a on spot, on the spot decision and decide if he's gonna buy or not. And he doesn't know necessarily when this guy is coming next and what products he may have. So he'll understock or he'll overstock. May I ask you? So, yeah. This is not regulated, I guess. It's just an um, informal type of activity or they have a license to do so. So everybody here has a sort of license, okay? Now, where it goes, it, it's gray. It's not completely black economy, it's sort of gray. So the uh, uh, most often, more often than not, the traveling salesman has a license to do this job. More often than not, the smaller retailer has a license to actually sell the products. But they, either of them may not necessarily declare everything that transits uh, uh, through them, okay? And that's one of the reasons why the FMCG manufacturers who are more structured companies, oftentimes, uh, it's, uh, how do you call that? Uh, you know, limited company, I think, or something like that. Anyway, there's sort of a scrutiny around them and they can do whatever they want. So they'll sell to the wholesalers. And the more down you go through the chain, the less scrutiny there is and the more people take liberties with uh, what's happening, okay? And essentially oh, that- Sorry, what is the problem with that? Is it then, then uneven, like crazy prices um, or, you know, with, with all these many layers, like what, what challenges does it cause? So you have an obvious one. Huh? The obvious one is uh, working capital and, uh, and margin. Essentially, you have many layers, so people are going to split the margin. Working capital because uh, the manufacturers, when they sell to the wholesalers, theoretically, it can be 30, maybe 60 days. In practice, it can go a lot more. There's a problem with like collecting receivables overall and also with speculation. So uh, let me give you one example. Uh, when the first wave hit, people uh, uh, in, in Tunisia, people wanted to get semolina and um, you know pasta kind of products and flour and all, right? They, they were like ready for the apocalypse. And we did not even have a big problem of supply, like we're producing, you know? There wasn't like a problem of like, hey, we don't have the stuff. But there has been sort of a, um, a bunch of wholesalers purchased that on like a long credit terms, kept it, um, colluded, and then uh, created sort of a, back, a black market where they were trying to distribute that. Uh, okay, so what happens? The, prob the biggest problem is 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 on the the opacity. Okay, so you sell your product to this guy. He'll 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 pay you later. He'll use that cash if he started selling your product. He can even like completely destroy your prices and sell your product at a loss to use that cash to go and get maybe other products with like 20, 25% margin. And he'll do his business with that. Sometimes he'll keep your products and he'll sell them later, uh, trying to create maybe a, 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 a rise in the prices or a sort of a, a, of a scarcity. Um, and sometimes it's just, you know, he's selling your product, but you don't know where, you don't know what's the typical basket of the retailer, et cetera. So as a manufacturer, this is 85% of the commerce in Tunisia, just to be clear, and same in the other countries of the Maghreb. So the lowest estimates will place that at 70%. People do not buy their stuff from supermarkets, except maybe people like me, yeah? And, and like a few, a handful of, like, uh, of, uh, of, of the people in, in the country. So you have no clue what's happening. You don't even know what the price, what price is applied. You wanna push a promo, and you want that promo to be pushed uh, 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 further down the chain, you can't control that. And that's the biggest problem they have. So that's why for us, it was important that, well, we're super transparent on all the prices and we're actually a marketplace. And that's why it was super important that we send, we add a layer of data and send them like reports every week and gradually move into dashboarding uh, what's happening uh, with, with the products uh, down the chain. So this is the value proposition we're bringing to them. Destroying this opacity and yeah, paying them faster. That's that's like the obvious one, but the, the, the long-term one is, is really the, the getting rid of the smoke screen. Interesting. Wow. So from the journey of uh, product, you know, like helping truckers to moving into FMCG to then focusing, honing in into small shops, 
um, and then specifically distribution and then uh, pricing and products using data as your as your like end product. Interesting. Um, Stefano, do you have um, any questions for far as? Sorry, that's not necessarily the end product. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. The, the vision is, uh, is, is through different phases, right? So yeah, first we're going to have to distribute and probably do it not exactly ourselves, but kind of oversee the whole order management process, okay? Um, we're building the layers of data. The, build, the layers of data will be the most important thing later on, right? Like we're going to allow for smooth movements between these and kind of create the technology that allows an ecosystem to fulfill, okay? You can do that immediately. You can do that in any emerging markets. And this business only makes sense in emerging markets. You don't have the, uh, uh, the right players in the logistics space uh, and in the warehousing space. And then where we might be a little bit different than other players in adjacent markets, such as perhaps Soko Watch, uh, you know, Maxab uh, 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 and uh, Trade Depot, for example, in the continent, is that our angle is again, and that's what we keep, uh, is the retailer. So as soon as we fix this, rather than going into other areas of last mile, like hotels, restaurants, etc., our angle is the vertical of the retailer. So we want to build services around the retailer. You have such a density of such retailers across the different countries, and there's such a sort of a social, um, social fabric around them like it used to be back in the days, uh, at my, my parents' time, where you get all the news. It used to be where uh, it, it, it partially still is. So we wanna build, we wanna make them, I don't wanna say great again, because we wanna make them actually great and build services around them, but it's like, we wanna focus on that vertical and that's the end game. Building things around mobility, access to finance, we will see, but this is definitely uh, way too early to, uh, uh, to deep dive on. Yeah, I have a question actually, like every marketplace has the same issue, which is a chicken and egg situation. You need uh, the two, party to, two parties to come in at the same time. Otherwise, if you start from one side, then they will complain they don't have the other side and vice versa. How are you overcoming this issue? Very good question. So in, uh, in July, uh, when we were experimenting, uh, we, we, were, we were struggling a bit yeah, with, with exactly this. So we managed to actually convince a few, <clears throat> a few manufacturers because essentially, you know, like, well, what's there to lose for them? You know, they, it's, it's an easy idea to sell to them. You might not get the best prices, but you can convince them. But uh, so we, we were focusing on that. So let's get the supply and then we're going to get into the demand on the, on the, on the retailer end. And on the demand, it was, it was far too complicated, even with a reasonably decent assortment. So <clears throat> what we did is that we needed, we couldn't get a larger assortment. It was complicated. The process was long and you were just selling an idea. So what we quickly discovered is that <clears throat> you need to actually um, build a lot of trust with the retailers. And so rather than just building it from scratch and taking a long time, we were, you know what, there's a system existing. What can we do to build with the old system and bring it in the new in the, in, the, in the new world. So we reached out and we found, uh, and this is where we hired one of the top, ex top management guys uh, uh, we got, Makram, who comes with like 20 years of experience in this. And essentially we got guys who were these traveling salesmen before. We got them as freelancers and we're like, okay, you know what? Come with us, we, you're gonna have an app, okay? It's gonna get better every time. We're gonna bring uh, more assortment and you're gonna place orders for the retailers and what will make and we'll make sure that we'll fulfill that okay so your job is a lot easier now you just you just sell okay you don't need to like you don't have to sell on the go with your goods and have this pressure you just sell stuff and we'll make sure we take care of the fulfillment wait, wait sorry first question um so aren't is, isn't your role to eliminate the these you know traveling salesmen's role or <clears throat> Maybe I misunderstood. Go ahead. No, 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 no. It's, it's, no, it's, it's normal that you think that. And actually, we thought that initially. Uh, but actually, no. The, we're, we're trying to change their job. We're trying to bring them in. So we, we don't want to... The guys we're kind of uh, in a frontal competition with right now are the wholesalers. Okay? 
and the, if there is another layer below in certain products, that one as well. For these guys, we're changing their jobs. We're transforming it. So right now, <clears throat> right now they buy the products, they go and sell them on the go, and well, they're effectively uh, delivering them. What's going to change is that at first now we're going incent to we're incentivizing them actually uh, to acquire, to bring in uh, new retailers with us, uh, to, uh, um, to place orders for them, to uh, gradually deliver to them orders that have been uh, uh, you know, placed beforehand, either by them or by a counterpart. Gradually, uh, we're releasing an app for the retailer himself in, uh, in actually two to three weeks. We're gonna incentivize them to push that app for the retailers uh, to put, and, and, uh, and gradually to bring them in there and their job is gonna move more towards delivering. And they're gonna make more just with these deliveries because rather than visiting 30 people and they're delivering to 12 and coming back with an empty, with a truck that uh, with stock still at hand and managing all of that and the receivables, they'll just have to go and actually visit and deliver to 25 people orders that have been pre-placed. So our idea is to transform their job into something that is, well, more, tech-based and more efficient in terms of the uh, delivery, the fill rate of the truck and the fill rate when the truck comes back. Interesting, wait, so, so sorry. So you, you are right now serving the traveling salesman um, as your sort of, sort of as your customer <clears throat> when, and eventually that's how you're gonna to get to the retailers, to the small uh, shops. Yes, but we're never gonna eliminate this role of this guy, all right? Yeah, so, yeah. You're just um, making it more efficient. You're changing it. They're, they're, they're eventually doing more sales, but in a different way. Yes, but also like why we don't eliminate, not because we don't want to, because we actually think we're going to crack the way to, you know, convince them that this is, you know, this is better with the app. But you're in a market where, you know, um, you will not have 100% digital adoption from the retailers, but we still want to serve them. Uh, we don't know what these numbers are going to be exactly. Uh, we have a bit of an idea. We have numbers for, uh, uh, we know what it is in Egypt. We can assume that Tunisia is, uh, uh, because of the literacy rate and, uh, and, uh, and, and in general more tech savviness, we can assume that it's going to be a little bit better, but it's not going to be fundamentally uh, a big difference. In Egypt, uh, I believe Maxab, I may be wrong, uh, but uh, uh, maybe this has changed, but they have around a third of the retailers who use the app directly and order through the app. A third who have sort of access to the catalog uh, and will order through telesales. They'll call and then they'll get, uh, uh, they'll get their products delivered. And then a third who needs agents to come to them and kind of push the different sales. So we'll keep that role where the agent will keep bringing orders, but we'll try to bring in this channel uh, and we'll try to make it as big as possible where you get direct orders. Uh, and then we'll build also a channel for uh, a larger channel. We already have it for telesales. That is, uh, that is the idea. <clears throat> I understand now why you said earlier that uh, b before we started the recording, you say you don't uh, have an elevator pitch because you probably you need the elevator to Burj Khalifa to explain <laughs> the business model. It's a very, very complex um, explanation that, that requires the audience to understand the, in depth the cultural and economical um, conditions of very specific markets. You, you can't probably copy and paste this business model anywhere else. But talking about business model, I'm wondering how do you make money? Yes. Uh, first, yeah, I, I, I think you can, you know, you can never copy paste if you want to do pro proper, you know, product development and, and user experience design and user research and and like, that's what my partner is like, you really one of the best product person I've ever met. Um, and, uh, but we believe the very similar markets are perhaps Algeria and Morocco, where we do intend to go. Now, the business model is a commission on delivered orders. So basically, we try uh, not to stop, we actually, you know, it's a marketplace, uh, we can have, uh, uh, we'll, we'll sell the goods, and then uh, we will uh, uh, we will uh, withhold a commission 
and we'll wire the uh, remaining to the uh, manufacturers. So that's how we're making money today. And the whole data uh, kind of component for now is completely embedded in this. It's part of the value proposition. Uh, it's, it's part of the uh, commission that we're taking uh, on, on this. And the commission depends on the category. So uh, if you're on, you know, uh, everyday products, the commissions are usually lower. And then on, on uh, you know, uh, biscuits, cakes, chocolate, uh, whatever, detergents, etc., you'll have higher commissions. So for now, what we have is something between 4 to 15% uh, of commission, depending on the category. <clears throat> Sorry, it took me a second to unmute. Um, so, Fares, what? Uh, so, you were talking about like serving the agents at the moment. Uh, I was curious to know what the feedback has been with these guys. What's the uptake? So, so far, it's positive. Uh, it's very positive in the sense that some of these guys, you know, they had no obligation to be full time with us, right? Because they're freelance. So many of them were working with uh, uh, even different distribution companies. And actually, uh, two of them uh, moved uh, full time because they just realized uh, the money they could, uh, they could make through this. They saw the improvement in the assortment and how, you know, how we went from you know, maybe 50 SKUs in the beginning to maybe 400, 500, sorry, now. So yeah, I think that's, that's the uptake. And, Overall, they are gradually making more money. That's how we're building our growth, and uh, and yes, so I think I think it's uh, it's uh, it's positive. Okay, so so these guys, um, they aren't doing this full time. They aren't being like traveling salesmen full time typically before they met you, or before they started using um, commune. commune. No, they, they, I mean yes, they are doing it full time, but maybe yeah. possibly for different clients. Uh, possibly for one client and, uh, and you know, having some spare time uh, uh, otherwise. In this case, the two that moved full time were doing, uh, were doing it initially with one single uh, wholesaler, okay? And they had a limited uh, uh, product uh, assortment to sell. So they started doing on the side with Commune, realized they had a bit more products to sell, realized they could make money on the acquisition and then gradually they moved in full time, even though, you know, they're sort of getting to the exhaustion of their portfolio of customers and now getting incentivized on just the order placement, but they're getting so much volume that it made sense for them. I have a question about, uh, if you are comfortable, can we talk about numbers? I am interested in finding out what's the average transaction that they make. And uh, you can say per transaction or per month, whatever works for you and if you're com comfortable to disclose the volume of business that you are processing through your platform i would guess do you do you call it platform the call sorry do you call it a platform do you call it an app do you, how do you call it is a platform a marketplace let's call it a platform yeah yeah it's, it's it's best to call it a platform because of the different channels that uh that, that can come in yeah so uh, in terms of the average transaction, I mean, this is, again, we launched like about, uh, about two months ago, right? So this has been something that, uh, that has been evolving. Overall, right now, we're at uh, uh, the average transaction that is at uh, $150 from inception, from the beginning, yeah? Uh, so perhaps it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit uh, more if we restrict to the last few weeks. Um, Sorry, what was the other question? Uh, if you can uh, share about the total amount that you are transacting or the monthly volume of business, if you're comfortable sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so far we've reached, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's the beginning, so the growth is quite high, right? So if I give you something monthly, it would be, uh, it would be a bit... Uh, uh, so overall, right now, we're around, uh, in terms of uh, GMV, uh, general mer uh, merchandising value, uh, we've reached several ten thousands of dollars so far. From the beginning, so around two months ago. Uh, that's where we are. I would like not to disclose the commission, the average commission. Do, do, you, have pro do you have projections on when you're going to hit your first million in transaction or this type of numbers? Can you share any uh, projected growth that you have in mind? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, our, 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 um, essentially, we believe in terms of uh, GMV, 
uh, that we will reach the million somewhere in uh, cumulative million uh, somewhere in uh, Q2. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing. Right. Diane? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so far, I was just curious um, about how um, your a bit more about your platform and how it works. So, let's say I I'm a traveling salesman and you're approaching me for this, you know, uh, to work with you. What are you using? What are you introducing? You know, is there an app I need to download or like how do you onboard um, this this person and then interact with them on an ongoing basis? So, uh, first thing is. At the end of the day, at some point, we're not going to need you necessarily to be a traveling salesman. Uh, at the end, uh, the, we will just need you to be a commercial person with a car. Okay? Uh, right now, we took uh, these people. They're very welcome to join us. Uh, but essentially, if you're going to limit it to that, and if only these people can do the job, you're going to be limited in your scalability. That was the first uh, thing. Now. In terms of the, uh, how, this is, how this is gonna work, you'll come here, we'll present to you the remuneration model on, and how we incentivize you on the different things. Uh, you'll download an app, uh, which is you know, still private. Uh, we're gonna explain to you how it works, how, you know, what are the delivery days, uh, the process in sort of like uh, when an order can be placed, uh, if there's anything you need to, how to use the app, the comments, et cetera, section. And then you're good to go. You just go, you can add, uh, uh, you can add in any retailer, even if you don't order for him, you can do that anytime. You can, uh, using the app, you can uh, uh, place orders for retailers choosing the delivery uh, date and you can indicate a preferred slot uh, and any, any other uh, comment you'd have. And if a product is not in stock, you will know you won't be able to, uh, to order it. Um, in case there are issues, etc., we have a dedicated channel where we can uh, talk to them. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, it. Oh, yes, forgot. Uh, if you're gonna do the deliveries, you also have uh, essentially you'll be sent uh, the different uh, orders, the different uh, people you'll deliver to, because you may not know them. They may be from a different uh, uh, delivery person, uh, from a different uh, agent, and uh, yeah, you'll just. You'll just use the app to, to you know, to go from one uh, to the next, and you'll have a geolocalization in there. That's that's how it works. So, so are you looking for, you know, I, I call them agents, but maybe you know, people, the the people that you you're speaking to right now. Um, the main thing that you probably would, would like them to do is it to collect orders for the retailers. Um, maybe do deliveries, but if not, that's fine also. So, yeah, I mean, we always try to balance things out. So uh, right now, uh, when we're adding, where we just added actually uh, 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 new agents, it's mainly to sort of uh, uh, add on the uh, order generation part. But we've decided we're going to start to make them deliver to their guys, right? So using on synergies when, as I'm delivering, I can take on the next orders, right? So this is something we're testing, uh, we're testing right now. Uh, very soon, the idea is gonna be, and that's what we want, for, as, as far as we're concerned, we're now in a, we consider this a testing phase, yeah? Where we're gonna like, kind of look for the perfect, uh, well, almost perfect uh, product market fit. And so the next step will be not necessarily, hey, let's just get growth at all costs. It's gonna be, okay, how do we get adoption for the app by the retailers and how can we build the best app in there? So that's gonna be the next thing we're gonna be looking at as soon as we release it. How do we get the agents to, uh, to onboard the retailers on the app? And how do we make sure that's, sustain that's done in a sustainable way? Mm, makes sense, makes sense. So your, your main um, thing right now, your main IP is, is the app and the relationships, I guess. And the database uh, that we are having data, uh, data that is growing, right? Okay. It's a database growing. Plus, we have uh, we also managed to get a twenty thousand uh, retailers database in the Greater Tunis. Uh, yeah, well, just just to give an idea, overall in the country, um, it's somewhere between a hundred thousand and two hundred and ten thousand such retailers. You know, mm. small shops. 
that accounts for kiosks, a bit larger shops, and you know anything below 50 square meters is considered a small shop. Thanks. Stefano, you have any questions for Faris? Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, about uh, investment, if it's possible, uh, a few questions. So first of all, you say that you just completed your friends and family round, and so probably you are going into angel um, at this point or seed. Um, how can an investor invest in, uh, in a commune? First, uh, first question, uh, I guess you're giving out uh, equities or convertible notes, I don't know if you can share about your investment structure. Uh, the second thing I wanted to ask you is, um, now I, I guess you are facing investors, is that a challenge for you to convince investors to invest in uh, Tunisia? Uh, and thirdly, is the climate uh, good for investment at the moment or you're getting more, you're getting more interest or more rejection now? More fear or more excitement? Okay, great question. So uh, yeah, we did the friends and family round around uh, March. Uh, right now we're looking to raise, yeah. Uh, so we're looking to raise around 200,000 right now dollars and then we wanna raise uh, a much larger amount in uh, six months. We decided to split it in two uh, to sort of, you know, uh, mitigate the fears of those uh, who may believe, you know, it's a bit early to get this. And, you know, it's an ops intensive business. It's cash intensive. Give an idea, Maxa raised in seed $6.2 million. So it's, it's a lot of money. I think uh, Sokowatch was 2 million in their seed. So it, it takes cash, yeah? So now uh, in terms of the investment, we, they can reach out to us. Uh, uh, we, uh, we offer the investment in convertible notes uh and uh yeah we're you know we're open to 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 uh reach to pretty much uh, anyone we've reached out to uh, business angels uh we've reached out to uh vcs uh we've reached out to people we know would only invest in the later round we want to keep it uh you know flowing and keep the full conversation going add them in a newsletter etc actually because of the answer to your second question which is Essentially, Tunisia is a market that today, if you look at Africa, okay, everybody knows Kenya, everybody knows Nigeria, everybody knows Egypt. These are markets that draw a lot of, of, uh, of, of investments and the VC world is sort of getting um, mature. Tunisia is getting there, right? So there has been this law called the Startup Act passed in, um, <clears throat> that got into action uh, about a year and a half ago. It's one of the reasons also we launched because you sort of have a safety net despite having a small market in Tunisia and, uh, and you know, not having yet all this traction, it, it launched this dynamic. So what's this dynamic? It gives a lot of incentives to entrepreneurs, fiscal incentives to uh, investors, especially if they're based in Tunisia. And uh, you know, for the startups, it's kind of like doing away with a lot of the old school nonsense uh, that's in Tunisia, right? Uh, there's a lot of bureaucratic shit, sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to, in, in, in here with like uh, companies and the business environment. And this is sort of an MVP of the future. So to give you one example, both my partner and I have a scholarship right now, thanks to the Startup Act. Okay, so we can just focus on the business and, and you know, we have a bit of, of leeway even after, we can even, we could even reinvest part of this. Where there's no tax on in, uh, on the profits, well, if you make any <laughs> at some point, and that's for like eight years, so it will be uh, useful at some point. And most importantly, you don't pay social contribution for the employees, which is a big part of the gross to net kind of thing. And then uh, the second part of this law, which is kind of it's still a bit early, it's coming next year. That's a bit of the timing issue. There's this thing called the fund of funds that's coming and this fund of fund with like uh, large LP money like World Bank and things like that. Uh, they've just nominated the uh, fund uh, manager. So a lot of money is coming is gonna be injected from next year in Tunisia. So I actually believe that uh, next year it's gonna be a lot of a different dynamic for um, the startups versus investors. I don't know, sometime in Q1, Q2 maybe, but there's gonna be a big inflow of cash in there. 
And it's been such a successful law so far that Senegal has copied it. And it's actually Kenya has just put a proposal uh, of something, yeah, a little bit more restrictive though, but uh, in, uh, uh, for, for the parliament. Startup bill. Yeah, yeah. Maybe so, it, yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's really a good law. It's really like something that's going to change things hopefully in the right direction. There's still restrictions. There's still a lot to do. Uh, but Tunisia is becoming a good place to, um, uh, to invest in. And again, it's like, um, it's, Tunisia is always a lab, right? So if you're a startup and even in something as big as distribution here, like overall, this market, the small shops, the total value is $9 billion just in Tunisia. So even this that is massive, uh, you know, you never just do Tunisia. Tunisia is a lab. You do Tunisia and then you do, uh, you, uh, uh, you move on to, to, to other countries. Or you start from Tunisia, you have reasonably cheap and qualified labor in the tech part and you do a SaaS business. So, you know, but so this is going to encourage, this is going to bring a lot more startups here and a lot more VC money, hopefully. So, yeah, for us, we, we, the, the conversation we have with, um, with, uh, with investors is like, look, first, you're not investing uh, in a business in Tunisia. You're investing in a team that's starting with Tunisia that has all the right environment to start in Tunisia, knows their market here and can, and hopefully is capable of replicating this uh, uh, elsewhere. And uh, yeah, you just, you just have to do everything that it takes to kind of uh, uh, reassure them. So, you know, we're building a strong data room. We have a lot of like uh, documents also on Tunisia. We put them in touch with, um, you know, more local investors or like regional investors who are based here such as like African Invest, for example, who are more of a late stage uh, kind of fund, but respected in the region. Uh, yeah, so you, you got to do what you got to do. You, you, you just need to reassure them with, uh, with all of that. So what's the ideal profile of the investor at the moment? You're looking for one investor that brings you through this stage or would you prefer to have uh, multiple? Uh, are you looking for strategic investors like one of the manufacturers maybe that acquire mm -hmm. part of the company or you prefer to have someone that is external to the trade in the region or outside the region? Ideally, you'd want something in the trade, right? But now let's talk about the reality of the market. Um, you need someone to understand how startups work, right? And not come and, you know, ask for five seats at the board and, uh, uh, you know, 50% of the company uh, because it's like, yeah, you're just making this in revenue. So it doesn't, you know, needs to understand the dynamics of the scale and the cap values and et cetera. And unfortunately, that's not a local uh, or even regional uh, manufacturer uh, for this, okay? There may be some family offices we're missing uh, on this, but but uh, uh, yeah, that won't be that. But ideally, that's what you want. Someone who also like open doors for you and be being there. Maybe someone in the distribution business who wants like, you know, knows that they can change on their own and they can like, they have like some engine behind it to do this. Uh, so what we're looking at now is more of an investor who is uh, the ideal profile, who is familiar with this. So they know about logistics, they know about FMCG, they know about, they know about this complex system. It's, 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 uh, it's a complex problem that will, uh, you know, uh, will require complex solutions explained simply to the different users, uh, you know, and you'll want someone who will be able to kind of like uh, guide you in that, et cetera. So we've been looking at people who've invested in similar businesses elsewhere. Um, we might have, you know, missed some, but this is, this is the, the sort of investor we're looking at. So it's going to be either a syndicate of business angels or, um, or like a, a VC for now. And in the in the the extension of this round, it's it's a lot of money. It's going to be professional VCs. It's it's going to have to be that uh, big seat round uh, investors, ideally familiar with you know either Africa or Southeast Asia or Middle East or you know like just someone who can sort of understand um, what remotely what uh, this is. Uh, uh, I think that, that's, that's what it would be. Um, okay, so I, I think we're coming close to the time, so I, I want to ask um, what I think will, is, will be our last question uh, before we close out. Um, 
so you sort of alluded to this during the conversation already. Uh, but I wanted to ask uh, uh, maybe if you can provide an answer in a succinct way about uh, your plans for the future. Plans meaning, you know, like your one year plan versus your one to five year plan. Uh, you mentioned something along the lines of uh, the app uh, for aid, uh, sorry, for the retailers. Uh, you talked about expansion to maybe Algeria, Morocco kind of thing. Um, take the floor. So <clears throat> the idea that we have is uh, so sort of this quick round, um, get our full product market fit, you know, uh, uh, we do have good traction. It's probably going to continue, but we consider a full product market fit once we've tackled the needs of all these different users in a way where we're like, okay, this is it. Uh, raise our seed round, like the, the rest of it, move into a hyper growth phase, become the market leader in Tunisia by um, Q1 2022. Raise a series A, uh, move on to a second country, could be Algeria, could be Morocco. Very quickly move on to the, to the second country. Um, unlock at that same time, try as much as possible to be more hands off. You know, we build the bricks of this distribution marketplace and we'll try to remove the bricks, right? We'll try to, uh, to sort of have more of a tool for warehousing, a tool for delivery, but just keep, keep more of a focus on, on the uh, prices and sales data and stock data uh, uh, aspect. And then start working on the vertical. Okay. And uh, this is around like, you know, difficult to say, but around 2023, uh, start working on that vertical in the different uh, uh, countries, probably earlier in Tunisia, and building perhaps more services uh, around the retailers. We don't foresee getting outside of the Maghreb region, so Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, uh, before, you know, maybe five years or something. Uh, and then, yeah, then, you know, Five years in this world and in the startup uh, startup world in general is uh, infinity. So uh, difficult to uh, uh, to uh, to know what happens after. Makes sense. Great, uh, Stefano. You uh, you have any questions? Last questions for Faris? So, um, or you want to close this out? I think we nailed him uh, very well. <laughs> we asked him pretty much all the questions. Perhaps we can we can uh, uh, give uh, Faris one last uh, minute to. Uh, talk to our audience and uh, make a wish or just communicate to a potential investor that might be coming across the podca this podcast and, and give a one last uh, message to the ideal stakeholder? Um, I think, I mean, you know, investors uh, can always reach out, but I think my main message would be on uh, more generally entrepreneurs and people who want to, you know, take the leap and, uh, start something in in in, in Africa <clears throat> um, there's a lot of infrastructural problems to solve and these problems you know like it's gonna need a lot of us to get there and honestly if we're not the ones to succeed but these problems get solved these are the ones that are the pathway to development not some bullshit donor money channels through NGOs etc like I mean that's helpful in the short term but transformational things, things that will, uh, you know, really bring us uh, as a continent and more generally in developed nations into developed world are how, if, if, if some of us can crack these infrastructural issue, issues. And I really, really encourage uh, people to like join these startups, give it, you know, I know it's a risk. I know it's, it's a problem. Join us, join others that are tackling similar problems in the continent um and or start something of your own and yeah that that would be my wish that that uh that people tackle uh, tackle these in a relentless uh, uh way until until we've got things that work uh that would be my that's wish a, that's a great message actually i don't know if i mentioned but i spent some time in uganda and i realized that and and diane in kenya you too in kenya um we, we we know a bit Africa and uh, definitely as yes, we wish that the continent overcome those major challenges that are logistic. But uh, you're right, it takes some uh, um, bold move and risk taking a, a person that just decided wants to do the good for the continent. That, that's a great wish that you have for. for and that goes with investors. 
like investors need to take the leap. Yes, it's probably a bit more risky, but you know, are you gonna keep investing in the nth SaaS business in Silicon Valley? That's, you know, it's like, no, like there's a lot to do here and it's actually gonna have a, 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 an, an impact, a massive one. So just look this way. <laughs> well said, Faris, leading by example. <laughs> Thank you for your time, Faris. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.